I have here two books, Charles Darwin, The Origin of Species, and the Holy Bible. Now, some people might claim that The Origin of Species is my holy book. Uh, it's not. It's the truth, but it's not the way. The, the Bible is neither the truth nor, I would hope, the way. We're not talking about the truth tonight. We're talking about morals and ethics. I have been studying the Bible a little bit in preparation for this uh, <coughs> event. Read a couple of things. There's a, a nice story in Genesis. Lot, remember, was the only good man who could be found in the cities of the plain, Sodom and Gomorrah. Two angels came to visit Lot, and Lot invited them in to wash their feet and have a feast with them. But all the men of Sodom came and surrounded the house, demanding that Lot should hand over his two guests so that they could rape them. Now here is what Lot said. I pray you, brethren, do not so wickedly. Behold now, I have two daughters, which have not known man. Presumably, their virginity makes them especially desirable. Let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you, and do ye to them as is good in your eyes. Only unto these men do nothing. Well, fortunately no harm was done, and Lot and his family were singled out as the only good people in Sodom. Uh, spared that city's terrible destruction. Now, if that were the only example of such an incident, I wouldn't have remarked it, but a little bit later, in Judges 19, verse 20 to 30, here we have a certain Levite who had gone chasing after a runaway concubine. He eventually tracked her down at her father's house. Her father was delighted to hand over uh, this woman to her rightful owner, and the party set off home again. On the way, he was given lodging by an old man in Gibeah, in the territory of the Benjaminites. As in the other story, they all washed their feet and had a good feast. And again, as in the Genesis story, the men of the town started beating on the door and demanding that the visiting man should be handed over so that they could rape him. Once again, the master of the house went out to remonstrate with them. Nay, my brethren, nay, I pray you, do not so wickedly, seeing that this man is coming to my house, do not this folly. Behold, here is my daughter, a maiden, and his concubine. Them I will bring out now, and humble ye them, and do with them what seemeth good unto you. But unto this man do not so vile a thing. But the men would not hearken to him, so the man took his concubine and brought her forth unto them, and they knew her, and abused her all the night until the morning, and when the day began to spring, they let her go. Then came the woman in the dawning of the day, and fell down at the door of the man's house where her lord was, till it was light. And her lord rose up in the morning, and opened the doors of the house, and went out to go his way. And behold, the woman, his concubine, was fallen down at the door of the house, and her hands were upon the threshold. And he said unto her, Up, and let us be going. <laughs> but none answered. Then the man took her up upon an ass, and the man rose up and gat him unto his place. A happy ending, you might think. But the unfortunate woman's troubles were not yet over. The story has one last verse. And when he was come into his house, he took a knife and laid hold on his concubine, and divided her, together with her bones, into twelve pieces, and sent her into all the coasts of Israel. Now, I make no claims that my book, The Origin of Species, is any sort of dyed or living. Quite the contrary. I have often said that if you want to use Darwinism as some kind of morality play, treat it as an awful war. <coughs> Hitler is not the only person to have misused and abused Darwinism for immoral purposes. Maybe <coughs> 
really is red in tooth and claw. The end product of natural selection, life as we know it, is beautiful and elegant, but the process of natural selection is vicious, cruel, and short-sighted. A Darwinian society is not the sort of society in which any of us would wish to live. Speaking for myself, it's not a bad definition of precisely the sort of society I would least like to find myself a member of. Which is why the closing words of my first book, The Selfish Gene, were, we have the power to turn against our creators. We, alone on earth, can rebel against the tyranny of the selfish replicator. But I think it's really better not to use the facts of nature to derive our morality at all. I prefer to side with Hume rather than with either Julian or Thomas Huxley, who both tried to use evolution for purposes of deriving morals, albeit in opposite directions. Hume said that moral directives cannot be derived from descriptive premises, or, if it's more colloquially put, you can't get an ought from an is. Well, where on our evolutionary view do our oughts come from? Uh, Shmuley has challenged me to answer this question. It's a big question, and I would love to have an hour in which to try to answer it. It's not a simple one. The problem is not quite as acute as it might appear. It is a very somewhat naive view of Darwinism that says that, uh, literally, we should expect ourselves to be completely selfish. The idea of the selfish gene is that genes are selfish, but this is used as an explanation for why humans are, in a limited sense, altruistic. But it is only in a limited sense, and my own uh, subjective feeling, subjective experience, is that humans appear to be a lot nicer than we have any right to expect on Darwinian grounds, and we are certainly a lot nicer than we have any right to expect from reading the Old Testament and thinking that we've done anything from it. So, where, as an evolutionist, do I think we actually get our rather pleasant characters, in some cases, from? I believe with Peter Atkins that there's a distribution, there's an exceedingly nasty people, but there are also a fair number of nice ones too. <coughs> Partly an evolutionary mistake, that much of our evolutionary history might have been spent in small villages in which the members of the village would have been tried, uh, would have been closely related genetically, and also in which you could reckon that the people that you meet every day, you're going to go on meeting for possibly the rest of your life. Under those conditions, uh, Darwinism easily predicts a fair amount of pleasantness and altruism. But I think there's more to it than that. Uh, I find in my own gazing into myself and knowing my friends and uh, knowing all, all four of us on this panel tonight are decent people, nice people, who would be kind, who would be sympathetic, who would, uh, who would worry if they saw somebody, or even another, another species, a poodle even, weeping, uh, they would do something about it. That is not easily explained on selfish gene grounds. I am inclined to think it works something like this. Natural selection has given us big brains. It gave us big brains for good survival reasons. Originally, those big brains were used for utilitarian purposes, survival, out there in nature. Among the gifts that were given us by natural selection for those purposes were foresight, the ability to plan ahead, the ability to develop purposes and go for those purposes in flexible, versatile ways. Never before in the entire history of life has it been possible for action to be taken for the good of the future of an individual or a species. Always hitherto, action has been taken for the good of the short term, <coughs> selfish benefit of the individual. The human brain makes it possible for us to, to do that. We are capable, we are empowered by our big brains to sit down together to discuss the kind of society we wish to live in. If I sit down with anybody to discuss the kind of society I wish to live in, one of the first things I would do would be to say, take these two books 
and throw them both into the waste paper basket. As far as morality is concerned, take this one out again as far as telling you about the truth of life, how it got here, and how we all got here. Now, when I say that we can rebel and should rebel against the tyranny of <coughs> selfish representatives, some people have trouble with this because they feel I've somehow betrayed my own principles by on the one hand saying that we're survival machines programmed to propagate our selfish genes, and on the other hand saying we can rebel against them with impunity. How, they say, can you pick and choose in this way? Well, it's easy. You pick and choose in exactly the way religious people pick and choose. In this week's Independent on Sunday, Monsignor Kieran Connery, head of the Roman Catholic Media Office, uh, in a pamphlet called The Common Good, said, Catholic social teaching is rooted deeply in the Old Testament, when God said, I don't want sacrifices, I want justice for the poor. Well, I looked it up, it's true that you can find God saying that, he says it in Proverbs chapter 21, verse 3, and after that. But of course, there are numerous other places where you can document God's insatiable appetite for sacrifice. Preferably <coughs> bloody sacrifice, as Paul Cain discovered, when his offering of vegetables was scorned by the Pharisees. <laughs> <laughs> Or as Paul Isaac very nearly discovered from his celebrated narrow escape. <coughs> Pretty decent of God, you might say, to intervene at the last minute and explain to Abraham that it was only a tease. <laughs> <laughs> but if I did Isaac, I don't think I would ever have recovered. Pretty severe child abuse. <laughs> and God didn't always intervene on such occasions. Uh, in Judges chapter 11, Jephthah made a vow to God that if God could guarantee Jephthah's victory over the children of Ammon, Jephthah would without fail sacrifice as a burnt offering whatsoever cometh forth of the doors of my house to meet me when I return. As luck would have it, this turned out to be Jephthah's own daughter, his only child. Understandably enough, he rent his clothes. There's nothing he could do about it, and his daughter very decently agreed that she should be sacrificed. <laughs> she asked only that she should be allowed to go into the mountains for two months to bewail her virginity. At the end of this period of two months, Jephthah slaughtered his own daughter and turned her into a burnt offering. God apparently was not moved to intervene on this occasion. <coughs> now, of course, this sort of thing is ridiculous, naive, unfair. It's the one thing a historian must never do to judge one era by the standards of a later era. But of course that's right. <coughs> equally, you could find another whole set of texts to demonstrate how good God is. But you cannot have it both ways. If you are entitled to pick and choose the nice bits of the Bible and sweep the nasty bits under the carpet, fine. That's marvellous. But don't come back at non-religious people and say that without religion there's no deciding what is moral. You pick and choose among your biblical texts. What criteria are you using? You're using human judgment, mostly modern, liberal ideas of morality that have been built up much more recently over centuries of moral and political thought, both religious and secular. Nowadays, we agree that slavery is wrong. <coughs> Stoning women for adultery is wrong. Cutting off a woman's hand because she intervenes on her husband's side by grabbing his opponent's testicles in a fight is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Punishing individuals for the crimes of their fathers is wrong. You may remember that when David fancied Bathsheba and committed adultery with her, he had Uriah put into the, her husband put into the thick of the battle to get him out of the way to be killed. God was understandably angry, but he didn't punish <coughs> David. Instead, he killed David's child. Nowadays, we'd agree that wasn't just. 
nowadays we agree that if a man rapes a woman, he should not simply pay compensation to her father, and she should certainly not be forced to marry him. Nowadays we agree that Joshua's unprovoked attack on the city of Jericho, whose citizens have given no offence and were simply getting on with their everyday lives, would not be considered moral. <coughs> Indeed, the instructions God gave for the invasion of the Promised Land and the extermination of the people who were already there would nowadays be called ethnic cleansing even down to the detailed instruction to kill all the males and keep the females for yourselves. But the criteria by which we today decide that these things are not moral, today we decide that these are the bits of the Bible we're not going to read out uh, in our churches, in our Sunday schools. The criteria by which we, we have moved on are not biblical. I don't even think they're religious in inspiration. They're modern, liberal, humanist criteria. Now, there are still differences between religious and non-religious approaches to morality. Religious people often take a more absolutist view, for example. In the case of abortion, for some religious people, it's a very special issue because the fetus is human. Non-religious people might be more likely to take a somewhat more pragmatic view and ask questions like, is the nervous system of this fetus sufficiently well-developed that it can feel pain? Should we perhaps worry more about hurting an adult chimpanzee rather than a human fetus? because the chimp can think and feel more than the fetus. <coughs> or, say, if a man's life is saved by transplanting an organ from a pig, non-religious people will again tend to take a pragmatic view, but religious people might have to face various kinds of hang-ups. But these are minor differences compared with a huge area of agreement that any <coughs> modern, civilized people will have as against the morality that would have seemed normal in biblical times. Now, biblical texts and DNA texts, the texts of the selfish genes, are not that dissimilar. They're both digital, uh, they're both quite ancient. The DNA texts are about three or four thousand million years old, and the biblical ones are about <coughs> three thousand years old. But otherwise, they're somewhat similar. Uh, in both cases, um, they are, in a sense, prescribing a way of life. In both cases, the way of life that they're prescribing is supremely distasteful to me, and I suspect to many of you as well. In both cases, we have the freedom to rebel, the freedom to depart from the tyranny of the text. We have the freedom to sit down together and plan the kind of society in which we want to live. As I said, I think that freedom is one of many emergent properties of the fact that we have big brains. These big brains were originally evolved for purposes of selfish, short-term survival, but they became so big that they overreached themselves. They are now doing things which, from the point of view of the selfish genes, are bad, but we can do what we think is good, what we decide with our brains is good, we can consciously and deliberately overrule the dictates of the selfish genes. The important thing is that we should not get our moral precepts, either from biblical texts or from the textual tyranny of the selfish genes.
unusual and unusual. So things have moved on, and of course that is an important point. Religion has to be thought about, reflected on, and changed. It can't remain always the same, and it hasn't at all remained always the same. So it doesn't seem to me a good place to start in discussing morality and religion to take an outdated, an outdated view of very primitive religious beliefs. What you want to do is to say what's happened in the history since then. For example, the 8th century uh, prophets of BC, that is, uh, who reformed the moral beliefs that were referred to and insisted upon personal responsibility above all. There were very definite changes in the morality. Is this uh, change, perhaps Professor Dawkins suggested, due to uh, criteria which are liberal and humanist? Well, he thinks they are, and I agree, they are. The criteria that we now use to think about what it is right to do are liberal and humanist. Indeed. Liberalism <laughs> and humanism are about human freedom, human dignity, and human value. They're about human flourishing, the flourishing of human life. And I've broken this out and say the flourishing of all sentient life. But is that a non-religious criterion? Has it resulted from violent attacks on religion? Not at all. The Enlightenment, which I celebrate, uh, is the child of religious reform. I would only be sad about the fact that the Enlightenment went too far, sometimes in rejecting any sort of God, as well as rejecting the primitive and unacceptable idea of God. So the question, it seems to me, is what sort of idea of God are you going to have, uh, rather than saying, oh, well, God has to be the most primitive thing you can think of, and we don't want to have that. So it is a sensible question to ask, what sort of God is there? But of course, the biblical view has always, however primitive the beliefs were, and however primitive the culture was from our point of view, has always held the view that there is a creator of this universe who creates for good, and who is himself good. The process of religious reflection has consisted in thinking out progressively and in changing ways what this goodness consists in. It's been a series of progressive disclosures of the nature of God. It hasn't been a giving up of God, it's been a, an exploration of what it is that God has to be like if God is a good creator of a good universe. Now this is going to turn out to be very relevant, in fact, to the question of morality, but not in the way that has been suggested so far. It's been suggested perhaps so far that if God is relevant to morality or to religion is relevant, all you do is open a book, the Bible, read a sentence and say, ah, now I know what to do, I don't have to think about that, I just accept it. Well, that's nonsense. I don't know anybody who's ever conducted their lives in that way. Pick and choose, yes. But how do you pick and choose? The criteria are internal to the text. But not just confined to the text, they're internal to the communities which have used, reflected upon the text. And of course, the reason why uh, synagogues and churches don't now say, God really does want you to give your daughter to the first people who knock on the door, is that there have been centuries of reflection on this, which say that there are different communities which are slightly more advanced. And we don't think that that's the sort of thing that God really does require. The question is, where do these criteria come from, and more importantly, why are they important? Let me take my stand as a religious believer quite clearly on the humanist view that what matters is the welfare of humans. Although I actually take that more broadly, as I've hinted, the welfare of persons and of sentient beings. But it's about welfare, about the well-being. But that view is not anti-religious. That is capable of being, and I believe it is, and all the religious people I know, or at least the ones I speak to, or who speak to me, a view which says that's what religion is about. It's about how human flourishing can be accomplished, and it's a view which undergirds and underpins a belief in human flourishing. Now, we've heard that, of course, uh, the oppression of human beings and their disparagement and their use as objects and instruments is not confined to the religious. Uh, it is found in the irreligious. It's found in any human being who simply is evil. Religion is not a defense against evil in that you can't be a religious person who is evil. You certainly can. In fact, uh, if the churches are meant to be 
places where sinners go, you are going to go to find quite a few evil people hanging around, and you're going to think, well, I'm glad they're here because this is the place where we ought to be, but I hope they might be changed a bit by all of this. I don't think religious communities are people only for the morally poor, but they are places where morality is underpinned. And let me uh, just to spell out a little bit what I mean by this. Suppose that you think that uh, being a human is in the result of a million copying mistakes in the replication of DNA. So that you are simply an accident in the universe. Now you could say, as David Hume said, as Bertrand Russell said, my morality doesn't depend on my view of <coughs> human beings. I can have a humane morality and wish for <coughs> human flourishing, even if humans are accidental mistakes. But Bertrand Russell himself said, I have to admit that some of my firmest moral beliefs cannot be justified by my theoretical beliefs. And he found that rather worrying. And this question of what could justify you acting upon a belief in the importance and value and dignity of human life is a very worrying question for someone who thinks, well, human beings are actually accidental mistakes. There is no intrinsic dignity in them. There is nothing in them of objective worth or value. They just want to be thrown up. You can be good if you like. I'd be pleased if you were. Perhaps it's quite comfortable for me to be good within limits. But why should I go further than that? The question of why, you may hold, is unanswerable. I have a great sympathy for that. I mean, supposing you said, look, I'm not religious. Um, I don't know why I should be good. I agree with you. I say, no, uh, I hope you will be, but I don't know why you should be. And you might say, well, I just have to accept it somehow as um, just obvious that I ought to be good. But where does that ought fit into the universe? Another philosopher, J. L. Mackey, who wrote a good book called Inventing Right and Wrong, standard book in moral philosophy, said that people naturally believe that morality is objective. That is, we all really think there are obligations. There are things we ought to do. We are challenged. We think. I have to do this, I ought to do this anyway, even if I can't think of any justification. That sense of ought is somehow built into the human character, perhaps genetically programmed. Mackin says that's how it is, but of course this is a delusion. It's actually a delusion. And we could rebel against the tyranny of our selfish genes and against the programs which have been genetically hardwired into us and say, if I could stop being this feeling that I have a moral ought, I could have a much better life, really, and think, no, there's nothing to constrain me, there's really nothing there, there's nowhere in the universe that the ought could fit into. I would find that quite worrying as a non-religious person, and since I've been one, I know that I did find it quite worrying. Because I had the problem of saying, well, I can't find anything that would justify my acting on my moral beliefs. I could justify having moral beliefs, that is, uh, I know that human flourishing is in the abstract a good thing, well, who cares about the abstract? I mean, uh, what's it going to matter? Uh, there's nothing there which impels me to do this. What difference does God make? And again, I want to interpret God here in a very wide sense. We're talking about uh, a dimension of uh, human experience which is transcendent to humanity and which is felt as a moral impulse or lure or urging. Something which, as it were, calls us to something greater than we are and calls us to be self-sacrificing in the name of human welfare and flourishing. Uh, you can take that very broadly. You don't even have to call it God, but it's certainly part of what a Jew or a Christian would call God. And one of the most <coughs> important contributions of Judaism and Christianity is to make this clear that one of the ways in which humans experience their lives is as confronted with a moral demand to make humanity flourish. And that sense of demand is what doesn't let you remain free to do anything you want, whether it's cannibalism or the other things that Rabbi Botheac is so fond of. So, <laughs> uh, there is that problem. How does God fit into this? Well, let me just say how a theologian uh, who actually uh, tried to respond to the problems uh, of Leviticus uh, to some extent and has decided they really belong to a culture far away, and we've got to do something about this. And what you do about it is spelled out pretty clearly in the Bible, as a matter of fact. But what do you say about this? It would be, first of all, what would you mean if you said that there is a good God? British people say there is a good God. What would you mean by that? Well, this is spelled out fairly clearly. You mean a God 
who is concerned with and who expresses in the divine being beauty, compassion, wisdom, and happiness. These would be fundamental qualities of a God if there was a God. I mean, let's suppose it's just imagination. You're just thinking, well, what if there was? It would be a being of supreme beauty, compassion, wisdom, and happiness. Because that would be what goodness actually is. Those would be the intrinsic values which are worthwhile for their own sake. So, if there's a God, it's not going to be one of these people that goes around saying, going to kill uh, all the Amalekites if you can find any left, uh, and gives other absurd commands. It's going to be a being you have to reflect upon. That's the nature of this being. But still, if there is such a being, that's its nature, objective goodness. If that God then, as Jews and Christians believe, creates a universe so that there shall be other beings in it, sentient beings who can share in that goodness, then what they will be called to share in, being made in the image of God, is creativity, compassion, happiness, and wisdom. So the religious imperative is to aim at that life for everyone, that everyone shall have a share in those properties which are the properties of God. That means that morality actually is rooted in an objective purpose for the universe. It's not something you may or may not invent. Now, I know Atkins and Dawkins consistently say you're just inventing all this, as though you're just inventing morality. But are we really inventing it? Isn't there a doubt, a thought, a wonder anywhere that perhaps we're not just inventing it, but we're actually confronted by it? Something that is a mystery hard to grasp, which we should never confine to our culture and say, oh, now here, here's what God is, here's what this moral demand is, I've got to take it. That's something which would call you to a new insight and say, well, there are new things we have to respond to in our society, and it's actually the spirit of God which is calling you to respond to these things. Surely that's the way a genuinely religious person would see it. So there is an objective reality which obliges you to conform to the purpose of realizing those uh, intrinsic values of beauty, compassion, and wisdom. The importance of that, of course, is that Morality is not optional. It's not an option. We have to reflect on it to see what it is, but it's not something you can say, I can just ignore this. It is being true to what you are, because it's being true to what you are created to be. <coughs> the word virtue means acting in a way that is excellent and in accordance with the nature of what you truly are. If what you truly are is a child of God, created by God for relationship with God, for a share in that beauty, <coughs> compassion, and wisdom, if that's what you are, then to be true to yourself is to pursue those things with all your might against every temptation of egoism and selfishness. And that's what religion really is. It's putting aside egoism wherever it lies, putting aside oppression wherever it's found, and going for truth, beauty, and goodness and religion gives disclosures of truth, beauty, and goodness throughout history, governed by the cultures in which it's found, and therefore constantly changing, expanding, we hope, developing in insight, but always something which stands above and beyond you, calling you on an obligation, not an option. And of course, another thing about religion, and one which justifies your moral attitude, your commitment to morality, is that if God is the creator of this universe, then God's purposes will be realised. That you're not in a universe where, as a matter of fact, we don't know what's going to happen next at all because it is a matter of chance and it's amazing that we've got this far through a series of uh, accidents. And we've probably not been any further because ants are going to take over the world at any moment because they're evolutionarily quite well prepared for the atomic cost, of uh, You might say then, that's uh, one view, we can't say there's anything going to happen. So goodness has no object. That is, you might say you ought to aim at a just society, but of course there'll never be one because it's just and accidents, and probably other people are not going to be just anyway, so it's not a rational policy. If you're a theist, you cannot say that. You have to say that the just society which God wills, God will produce. God's purposes will be realized. So, actually, goodness is realizable and objective. Let me stress those things. For a theist, goodness is objective, it demands, it doesn't leave you free to choose what your morality will be, and it is uh, realizable, it will be realized. Moreover, and one very other important thing for a believer in God, is that your response to these demands will not be the response of a cringing, infantile idiot who doesn't use your mind. It will be the response of someone who is called into a relationship of love to a God of loving kindness, chesed. And that relationship with God is the most fulfilling relationship there could be 
It is the deepest personal relationship with a being who offers to you a share in that happiness which only God can give. In other words, your relation to a God is not one of simple blind obedience, it is one of learning a relationship of loving cooperation. Because of that, morality <laughs> takes a different context. Morality becomes not keeping some principles, which you might have chosen, but you might not. Morality becomes learning more about God. It becomes a growth into relationship with God. Therefore, the reason you obey God is because you love God. It's not because God threatens you. This God is a threat, you know, that really belongs to some other religious society. God is the God of a promise, and the promise is simply the being of God itself. Now, let me end with this thought. Morality just doesn't exist in a value. A <laughs> Morality depends upon a view of human nature. Your view of how important your morality is, of what sort of thing your morality is, depends upon your view of what human nature is, of what the world is really like. And although I am a humanist, a theistic humanist, I believe that a humanist who is not a theist has no justification for thinking that humans are particularly important in the order of things at all, or that the values they think are important really should really influence, influence it in any way. Humanism depends upon theism because human value can only be given by a god who is of supreme value and will guarantee that creatures created by God will realize the values that God has in mind for them. So let's think of theistic morality rationally as something which God promises and calls us to. A life, a happiness, a creativity, and not as something which exists as a threat, especially not an antediluvian threat uh, from ancient cultures long forgotten. Let's see this thing uh, as a, a rational progress. If morality is to be binding, important, life-enhancing, then it must somehow be rooted in reality. And the concept of God is the place where morality is rooted in a transcendent reality which calls humanity for, for, to fulfillment by relationship to it. That's the only morality that I recognize as justifiable and the only religion I recognize as true. said we must have religious education. Uh, religious education is necessary for the moral well-being of our children. Uh, Hitler changed his mind, and everybody changes their minds, um, except uh, Rabbi Gautier, who believes in immutability. Now, <coughs> Professor Ward is very happy to sweep away all of the primitive religion of Leviticus and similar books, and uh, my problem with that, as I say, is how do you decide what to what to speak away? But Shmuley is, is basing his case upon immutability. The immutability of the Ten Commandments is the only sure rock we have uh, in a changing world. But I just note that contradiction and just simply uh, reiterate the fact that God said an awful lot of other things as well as the Ten Commandments, and some of them were monstrous, others of them were very good, and we still come back to the point that you have to make your own choice which ones you choose and which ones you don't choose. Immutability won't do. You can find a biblical text to justify absolutely any horror you want. Keith Ward takes a, a more uh, liberal view. What matters is the welfare of humans and sentient beings, and I applaud his adding of sentient beings. It doesn't seem to me to be at all obviously silly that people, when offered the choice of saving a garden human or their own dog, might choose their own dog. It doesn't surprise me at all. Uh, I, can see it. I have a lot of sympathy with that point of view. Only if you're talking about us, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> but the point is that, that, that your own dog is something that you've loved for all of its, for all of its life. And I, I think that that is a different point of view. The, the alternative one, like the one that you're possibly relying upon when you say this and the one that, that gets obviously a warm buzz of approval from the audience <coughs> because we are deeply, deeply speechless society. We believe that there is something really
been a discussion about Homo sapiens, if there's Homo sapiens on the one hand, all the other species on the other. And that may be right, but it is justified, and it certainly <coughs> is not a very evolutionary view. Talking of evolution, I, I know that Professor Ward doesn't really think that evolution is a theory of chance, but just in case what he said misleads anybody, I was just remind you that uh, Darwinian evolution is anything but a theory of chance. Darwinian evolution is aimed. It's not aimed at good. If anything, we're talking in moral terms, it's aimed at evil, which is the point I was uh, making earlier. Now, Professor Ward says that uh, the... Uh, that his morality, as he wrote about, is based upon what matters is the welfare of humans and sentient beings. Now, that, of course, is a, is a workable criteria. We can use that, we can do moral philosophy, we can do the calculus of the kinds of things that we need to do in order to maximize the world of humans and sentient beings. You can do logic to discover when your beliefs contradict other beliefs if both of them are attempting to aim at this same end of the world of humans and sentient beings. But he says, if you don't have God, there is nothing to make you follow this. You can set it up as an intellectual exercise maximizing the welfare of humans and other sentient beings. But what is there to make you do it? Well, it's not that God threatens us. Oh, no, God doesn't threaten us. It's not that. It's not the, it's not the stick or the carrot that makes you do it. It is that the Spirit of God calls you to realize the values of beauty, compassion, wisdom, and happiness. Morality becomes learning more about God. Well, how do you learn more about God? Not by studying the Bible, I think you've adequately established that. You presumably learn more about God by thinking to yourself. You think to yourself, what is it that God must be like if he is to create a good world, to, create, to quote Professor Ward. Now, of course, it's circular. I mean, you're, you're using your man-given, your... your intelligence given the ability to decide what a good world is. You're saying, well, if God's good, that's what he'd be after. And therefore, I am going to strive to do God's will by doing that thing. But of course, the input as to what, what is the good, the input that enables you to decide what's good <coughs> and what's bad, comes from you. It comes, in other words, from, the, from exactly the same source as I'm advocating. It comes from your brain. We sit down <coughs> together and we think. We think with goodwill, we think with cooperation, we think with foresight, we try to work out what we think would be good. It doesn't help to say, oh well, by definition that's what God must want. If God isn't threatening us, why else does God make any difference? I think that the, the case has been made that we do not need God to be good. Thank you. 
and others will say it's not, uh, not so clear. So the gradations are a lot bigger than this <coughs> very um, yeah, black and white divide between religion and science or God and no God. It's, it's a continuum. But I think that where people who stress the <coughs> discovery part of ethics are stressing that uh, it, it's not something that if you said the opposite, you wouldn't be wrong. Right? That, and that, that is a thing I think that uh, my colleagues find very difficult to uh, uh, expand, that anybody does, really, who, who can't ob ground morality objectively in some standard rightness. Where if you said, this is a test, you say, well, that's correct, anybody who disagrees is wrong. Right? Or in morality, you can have correct moral statements, but we don't necessarily <coughs> know what they are. You don't turn into a... Uh, a know-all, just because you claim moral statements are objective. I mean, just one, just one question. Can we, can we have a question to Sarah, please? Yes, please. Uh, there's a question for Professor Martin. How do you explain that? How do I explain what? That. <laughs> <laughs> there are many things that I can't explain.
my knowledge of Darwinism, which tells me that we are going to get no help from our nature in this direction, means it's all the more urgent that we should think it through, think on our own two feet, and talk to each other about it.